I'll take off from where the last slide, which um, Dr. Kilani, who has been my teacher, he actually put forward. Uh, it was very clear that was in 2019 when this ban came. So a lot of work has been done. 2019, when you do a paper search, you look at studies which would have been done probably by 2017-18, which would actually have data of 2014-15. This is how we all do our research, right? So as you move forward, you'll have to look at that what we are discussing today about harm reduction. Let's not stand at two sides of the this part. I think that is a bigger problem which I have realized in my association with this subject or my interest in last three, four years. That we either stand on one side or we stand on the other. So we have policy makers, we have uh, these NG some uh, organizations for uh, help self groups and they will stand on one side as Dr. Kilani was saying to corner the person who is saying this is not good. But then we have a large chunk of medical professional who will stand on one side and they'll say, no, we don't want to look at any other evidence. Now let's look at the perspective where actually these things look at. Small disclaimer, the, the disclaimer at the below, neither smoking or vaping is beneficial to health. Let's get that thing clear for people who are here, right? Smoking appears to be more harmful than vaping. However, it does not mean that vaping is safe. Nobody, at least from my perspective, I don't stand on that side of the beach and say this, this is a safe side, right? It's where and how. We have medicines, we have where we use them day in, day out for a particular individual in the right perspective. I think we have oncologists with us. Chemotherapy has super side effects, but don't we use them where it is required? We do. So where do we actually fit in is that I think should be the base of the discussion of these forums, not standing one side or the other. This was the worst discovery when you started rolling out cigarettes in millions. Cigarette became a finely tuned drug delivery system. I think if I have an inhaler which can deliver so well, probably my patients of asthma would probably be, uh, be finer for it. It's a bad habit. We have a boss of psychiatry in here. So it's a chronic medical condition, risks, global smoking. I'm going to skip through, just see the slides for whatever work I've put in. But WHO comes out with these reports here, and this is the last one which came out, which it calls it the epidemic. I think it was it is a pandemic which is already going on. We talk about COVID pandemic, but I think this is a pandemic which has been there where we have shut our eyes and we don't want to look into it. So with so many deaths, millions of people actually suffering. We are talking about long COVID. Why are we not talking about the chronic dependence of cigarettes? The facts, we all know. The pandemic actually opened our eyes that a lot of these patients who were having smoking died more. So this is the last uh, uh, thing which they have come up, is something called as M-Power, that how you actually look into the tobacco control measures. And surprisingly, one of by 2020, one of the best, highest achieving countries of tobacco dependence treatment is India. We all may have our, uh, our comments on that, but this is what WHO says. Why is smoking still a problem? Right? The problem is that if you look at data across the globe in best of centers, but when you actually percolate it to a larger subgroup, you will find that people who are interested in quitting are maybe 70%, maybe 50-60% attempt quitting, but unfortunately, the smoking cessation rates drop down to something like 7.4%. So despite a patient of mine who has COPD, who is smoking, he wants to quit, the best chance I give him is less than 10%, which is, I, we all agree, is not very good. So that led to a lot of voice in the community of, can we actually look at tobacco harm reduction as a public health opportunity? I'm not very sure if this for um, can will agree to it, but I think that is the main thing. And there is going to be disagreement. I picked up this slide from Smoke Free World, and it says that you have, as I said, you will have a whole gamut of people looking into it who will refute the point to probably go on to name calling, and I hope we don't do those things in this August forum. But unfortunately, there is no other aspect that ex that we debate on it. We debate and come to something which is good for the society. Standing at one side probably is not going to help at all. What is harm reduction? We all know. We all practice harm reduction in our daily. It is well established fact. 
that harm reduction has probably found its voice in IV drug users, right? And it actually made, WHO went on to say that uh, probably it's endorsed the use of harm reduction, especially say IV syringes. So why don't we actually look at 1.1 billion smokers and look at the same concept when we can look at say 1.5 or uh, 15 million uh, IV drug users, right? So there are pillars of tobacco control. I think these are more important than looking at the studies. I can, I will present the data which is going to be entirely different than what uh, Dr. Kilani said. Prevent, prevention of initiation, number one, is the best. We are greatly lagging. The policy makers, the government, all over the world are lacking in prevention of initiation, which means there should be a complete ban on all tobacco products. But it gives us taxes, obviously, so there is less said that is better. Assistant with cessation, we try, we try, we still do not achieve what we want. 10% is the best. Protection from ETS, again, a lot of work is being done. But is harm reduction one of the pillars? There are books written about it. Sometimes people, my friends who would have not have actually had a look to look into this aspect of medicine would, would not believe that there are proper definitions and proper recognition of this tobacco harm reduction. It is controversial, there is skepticism, there are aims of THR which are well published and I'm skipping these through and maybe we can discuss when we have time, but I'm just getting you to the context. The context is because there is limited success. There is a new environment which is developing. The perception of targets, the tobacco industry is now publicly acknowledging that there are dangers of smoking. So even they are accepting and probably to their own need, they are now accepting that the smoking itself is killing their own consumers and probably they have to move away from it. There are new novel products which are now coming and there are concerns about probation of this. There are public health motives, tobacco industry has its own motives, the pharmaceutical industry will have its own motive and a strategy has to be devised by all the learned people. You quit or die, I think this is what we always tell, chordo as a doctor. When we were young and studying in M MD, our professor used to say, take the cigarette and put it in the dustbin and tell him, see, do you want to pick this up from the dustbin? So that was something like a cold turkey technique, right? So quit or die was something like this. But can it be quit or switch? I don't know. But that's what the data is going to look at. So there is a large hierarchy of uh, products which can create uh, harm reduction, which are called as potentially reduced exposure products, which I'll just skip through. So nicotine, as Sir said, probably is banned in any food item, but you will be surprised that all potato family products will have nicotine in them, right? The, the, the level of nicotine is obviously consumable by humans and it does not cause any harm. The tobacco plants have a different level of nicotine. So mixing of nicotine in food products is definitely not there, but sometimes this is a natural ingredient in many, many food products. It's the root of the uptake that determines the speed of dependence. Am I right, sir? But that is what is going to so the worst which could happen with this was the modified tobaccos which are called as light cigarettes somewhere in 1950s this was the biggest disaster for the subject of uh, tobacco harm reduction because this was a sort of a camouflage by the industry to sell more cigarettes by the time everybody realized people were hooked on people had died and so it was almost a belief that there is nothing called as safe yes there is nothing called as safe but do we have products which can actually lead to lesser harm. So quickly coming to those things, I'll, not, I'll skip everything about e-cigarettes because Sir has already said, I'll tell you the data. So the biggest proponent of e-cigarettes in their so-called proper protocolized use is UK. Public Health England actually puts it as one of the suggestion uh, techniques, but it tells you where. It is for people who cannot quit despite all the efforts or are not willing to quit. So there will be someone who will say, it's my right to smoke, I don't want to quit. So can we offer them something, right? Or we say, no, we have, everything is banned, so you continue with your normal smoke and die. We will not give you something which can reduce your harm. This is the whole probably uh, thing which we understand. So a lot of data has come in last two years in big journals. This is a study in JAMA published from US where they had a large cohort from 2014 to 19, five years of, of data where they the results showed that 
actually e-cigarettes every day the people who are using e-cigarettes experience an eightfold higher odds of cigarette discontinuation than those who do not use e-cigarettes the this was the conclusion that these findings support the the consideration of smokers who are not planning to quit when evaluating the risk benefit potential of the, so those who are not planning to quit or who fail quitting are the ones who should be we are i am not saying please start selling this to new people this is the the unfortunately this is the problem which occurs that either we say we sell it to everyone on the counter or we say that you don't give it to even those who deserve it so this is somewhere we great britain this is a survey which started in 2010 and 2021 march study so this is the last one which they published about the awareness the awareness has definitely increased the attitudes have changed the different products are available and i'll show you one something which is very important which is the the um, the the subject which you actually talk to that if you actually look at the findings from the public health england uh, network it will say that 27% of people use a vaping product to quit attempt in previous 12 months as compared to and 15% using nrts now let me quickly show you what you said people do realize that if you look at the perception the black one is who actually still believe despite a proper program in place in uk that this is more or equally harmful so it is not that they have started believing that these are stuff which are uh, probably of no point and you can just use it as you want it is not that the other important thing actually comes in is that if you look at the the randomization of nico nrt versus e cigarettes as sir said that they were now this is a ngm article published a couple of years back where it had around 880 participants the one year abstinence rate was 18% in the e cigarette group as compared to 9.9 in the nrt group so statistically significant and not only that among the participants who completed one year of abstinence the e cigarette group was more likely than those in the uh, nrt groups to be probably using that same product at 52 weeks that's almost 80% versus 9 that's a huge discrepancy i'll not go see e cigarette data you can find both side asthma heart disease good bad different societies coming and looking at the data at different levels so let's not go get into those things because nobody is saying that you use e cigarettes to everyone i am saying that if a cardiology patient is not able to quit we know that continuing smoking will definitely cause harm there is huge data but now if we replace it with a product which is probably less harmful so it shows that that there is data to show that the impact on the heart and circulation is better than rather than actually conventional cigarettes that is the point it is not that we are not saying a or b absolutely stop cigarette there is no 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 risk at all nrt is again We, this is a very nice thing which i wanted to show this is the whole continuum of harm reduction so most dangerous are the combustible tobacco products then chewing tobacco products the least dangerous will be nrt because this is just one like to like substitution of nicotine the problem is of acceptance nrt is available in all our programs tobacco dependence programs in india it is available on the counter how many what is the sale you sir would know that if you ask companies there are hardly couple of companies who want to who, who have come out and they don't even promote that to the doctors it was very f- recently i came to know that there is a company which makes makes lozenges and i started writing them to my patients and they can't get it because they manufacture but they hardly use it probably they give it to only a cessation cessation clinic rather than actually putting it in the public so what will that smoker do he doesn't have the ex- the the acceptance will become so we will not go into the different products i think uh, time is short finally the biggest chunk of that white paper was that it will be a gateway to smoking for the youth this is 2017 18 the data now this is data from vaping in england where they have already allowed and obviously they were able to uh, since public health england is attached to nhs it it catapults all the data from people whom they are uh, being asked to use so you will find that there are two reports of 11 to 18 year olds and 16 to 19 year olds the prevalence has remained the same this is 2021 data last year this year's data hasn't been published yet but the data there is little change in the level of vaping over the last few years there is little change in the smoking prevalence in that age group so if this was a uh, the uh, probably a gateway then the new smokers should have increased so probably 
the smokers who are changing, who are quitting and using vape, the numbers has still remained the, the same. This is same in the data in 16 to 19 year old. The current vaping prevalence is around 7.7%, which was same, say, 10 years, 7 to 8 years back. So it's very difficult. Most young people who have never smoked or never vaped, it's around 08 to 1.3%. And uh, young people who have had never uh, smoked were current vapers, only 1%. So that's a very, very small um, subgroup. Most current vapers in children or adults were either former or current smokers, right? So implications are that obviously we, we have to look at probably newer things. We have to look at how we have a product which has reduced risk but has more acceptance. And I think the psychiatry people will be able to inform more easily that why does a patient feel more uh, satisfaction using an e-cigarette than a chewing a tobacco. And I'm sorry, being a pulmonologist, I'm keeping more towards the cigarette smoke, not for the oral tobacco. I don't deal with that. So I, I, I cannot give you personal experience, but that is how the things are. So you have to look at a product, harm reduction will be composite of a reduced hazard with the number of users using it. So NRT is brilliant, reduced risk, extremely low acceptability and use. So the public health impact would be very small. If you look at snus, which is a, something which is used in Sweden, again, low risk, more than a nicotine replacement, but high acceptability. So their public health impact has been quite good in their public health studies. So I don't know about e-cigarettes. Can we actually achieve something with, on those terms with these things? So we have to look at a balance between low risk and high acceptability. This Iwali for pulmonologists was something which probably pushed us away from e-cigarette things. Last couple of slides. So tobacco control is far from finish line. We all have to look at this whole continuum for my patient and then for the larger society and see where we can fit these in. There is actually a need for new RCTs. Unfortunately, I tried, but there is nobody to fund those RCTs. It's very difficult to find funding, which is A, uh, has no bias because the, phar the pharma companies won't push RCTs for these. After the ban, it is impossible to do it for patients in the clinic. And thirdly, the, uh, the people who are ready to fund would be uh, somehow X, Y, Z involved in cig finally selling uh, e-cigarettes or similar products ends, so which you cannot take because then it's a, it's a bias. So I think there is, n there is a need for appropriate RCTs. There is a need for appropriate regulation. It cannot be all or none phenomena that we have it or we don't have it. We ban, considering we would not be able to regulate. That is what I, I feel, that the ban in India was because we understand, looking at our population, it will be impossible to, to regulate. Now, US, uh, Australia is one of the countries, last year, it went on and actually made it available by prescription. So this is something which can we can start. We, even if we have a ban, if a doctor wants as a part of a smoking cessation, why shouldn't we be allowed? That is the question. So way forward is policy making, all you are from different specialities. The pillars of tobacco control, those three will stay the way they are. We have to incorporate harm reduction now into those pillars and probably look at the striking a balance between these two. It's a teamwork. Tobacco use uh, and fighting these is a team effort. I cannot believe that one person will stand up here and say, I will do it all my own. It is not. Behavioral support. It's a multidisciplinary approach which needs to be. So I'm sorry if I, I've been trying to be very fast, but I think I hope uh, I've got the point across that let's not stand at two sides, right? And try to probably join hands we may have our thinkings which are different and I think as medical professionals, one thing which is very good is that we are taught to read and then change our thinkings. We have changed our thinking in so many diseases over so many years, right? So I think that should be the dialogue in such forums rather than having this is good, this is bad because unless as doctors we are not able to find a, a, a one middle path, we will not be able to influence the policy makers uh, then this thing will stay the same. So thank you so much.